So um, we've been going through this uh, series, we're almost done, Discovering Jesus. We've gone through the entire Bible in one short year. That's pretty epic. Give yourself a round of applause. It's pretty incredible. We are in the book of 1 John today, and I got to confess, this is my fourth version of this sermon. There is so much in 1 John, I just couldn't decide where to go with it, so this might be a little bit of a mishmash of stuff, um, but hopefully it'll make sense. Um, I've got three big ideas. I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to give you a break on the practice uh, today. Uh, all my introverts are smiling and happy. Because um, I just want to jump into the, the Bible and really focus on what it has to say to us. Today, there's kind of three big ideas that I want to cover in 1 John. The first is that Jesus is incarnate. Say incarnate. incarnate. All right. What does incarnate mean? In the flesh, right? Like carne, like carne asada, chili con carne. Right, Jesus incarnate uh, is Jesus in the flesh, um, and then the second one is that Jesus is light. Say light, light. and then Jesus is love. Say love. love. All right, so we're going to spend uh, the majority of the time on this idea that Jesus is incarnate because this is one of the most, if not the most, important doctrine for you to understand. As a Christian, uh, if you don't grasp this, then you're susceptible to all kinds of false doctrine, false ideas. This really is the hallmark of Christianity, and it's the core of our faith. So open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. This is the very beginning of John's letter. Um, this is the Apostle John, uh, who was... Uh, one of Jesus' favorite apostles, he was a friend of Jesus, he calls himself the beloved in his gospel, and this is John writing as an older uh, man, writing to a, a series of churches, and he's writing that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have not seen on the screen with our eyes, <laughs> which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. All right, so the, the first idea that we want to cover here is this idea that Jesus is God incarnate. Is it going now? Oh, it's going now. All right, whatever you guys did, thank you. Yeah, it's working now, thank you. Whatever that was, it works. All right, so this idea, Jesus is incarnate. Incarnate is God becoming real, physical, human being in the person of Jesus Christ. This is the doctrine of the incarnation. This is what Christmas is all about. It's not about gifts and decoration and presents or any of those kind of things. Even though those are nice, Christmas is about God becoming human. God actually coming down as a physical human being. John, in his gospel, not this letter, but in the gospel of John... He writes, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Say, was God. Yes. Right? He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not anything was made that was made. That true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world, and the Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son of God, full of grace and truth. So this is a very similar opening to his gospel that he had to his first letter, right? He starts off same, almost identical wording, in the beginning. This Jesus was tangible. He was a real physical person. We saw him, we touched him, we interacted with him. 
This is one of the most important doctrines for you to come to grips with because this idea that God became a man in order to reveal himself to us forever removes the possibility that man can become God. And so I want you to log this in there. This idea of the incarnation that God comes and becomes a man s- removes the possibility of man becoming God. And this is important because most false doctrines reverse that concept. This is what the devil came to Eve in the garden. And what did he say? Hey, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what will you be? You'll be like God. It's a reversal of the incarnation. This deification of humanity, this elevation of mankind to this place where we become God, where we are in control, where we call the shots, where we're sovereign over our destiny, where we determine what happens in life. All false doctrine is built around a rejection of of the incarnation most people don't realize it that crystal clear but that's what they're doing in their life they are denying the reality of god becoming man all right so look at first john chapter four verses one through three this is critical here this is critical 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, I'm going to read it to you. It says, Many false prophets have gone out into the world, and by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. So way to realize the rejection of Jesus being God, coming in the flesh, that is anti-Christ. That is anti-Messiah. That says we don't need a Savior. That's what anti-Christ means. Christ is the one who was sent. It's the Greek version of the word Messiah. It means you don't need a Savior. You are good on your own. You'll be able to figure it out on your own. This idea of redemption, salvation through Jesus alone uh, is something that if you deny or don't uh, embrace the incarnation, you are denying this idea that you need a savior. You can't have both. Okay? So this idea that anything that denies Jesus is God incarnate is false. Say false. I want to give you two examples of this. The first, hopefully it'll follow along here. The first is Mormonism. Uh, and uh, I was just up in Idaho, so it's, it's really uh, fresh in my perspective. Uh, in fact, I found out that the Mormons are getting rid of every mention of Mormonism. Do you know that? They're just calling themselves the Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ. They're removing the word Mormon from all of their literature from all their websites if you go on their website it's just going to be the latter saints latter day saints of jesus christ because they want to pass themselves off as fully christian okay and so this is what's coming and i want you to to understand that at the core of their religion they reject the incarnation of jesus christ Now, if you ask a Mormon, is Jesus God in the flesh, they will say yes. They will say yes. But how do they get there? That's the difference. All right. The difference is, is that they claim that Jesus was the first spirit child of Elohim and he became a God. He wasn't God becoming a man. He was a human, a created being who became a God. And the significance of that is that that then opens the door for any other human, any other created being to become a God. But what do we say? Jesus did what no human could ever do. Jesus was God becoming man That's incarnation, not man becoming God, deification. 
This makes sense? All right, so Mormonism is a false religion. Everything about it is false. Uh, it's not man becoming God, which is what they claim, right, that you can become a God yourself. And ladies, I'm sorry, but you've got to be tied to a man because only men can become God. But if they like you enough, they'll pull you along into uh, God-likeness with them. Uh, this is a false religion. It's a false version of Christianity. Okay. The second thing, this is going to take a while to catch up. I should just like talk like five minutes ahead of my notes. Um, the second thing that I want to throw out there that's a false ideology is Darwinism or evolution. Darwinism is a false origin story. Say false origin story. Okay, this is critical to understand for a couple reasons. So... Evolution is basically the idea that human beings, as we know them, have come to exist from, we, we evolved from lower species over billions of years through a process called natural selection. Okay? The, and the interesting thing for me is that right now in America, so they've done some research, and 18 to 24 year olds, Right now, compared to 1988, in 1988, 54% of 18 to 24-year-olds believe that evolution was fact. Today, 18 to 24-year-olds, 68% believe that evolution is fact. Okay. So, 7 out of 10 Americans believe that evolution's fact. That means there's... And remember, 50% of Americans claim that they are Christian. So 20% are deceived because they believe that evolution is a valid origin story. But when you think about it, if evolution is true, then nature is the creator and not God. Nature is what generates life. There is no creator. So if you believe in evolution, you have to throw away the idea of creation, of a creator God. And, that ran, and then um, life is just a natural occurrence. It's not a supernatural occurrence. So if you believe in evolution, you believe that life is just a natural occurrence. If evolution is true then natural selection is sovereign, not God. You follow me? Because random chance and time is making all the decisions. That's the determining factor. Random chance and time is what's sovereign. So if you believe in evolution, Darwinism, then you have to throw out the idea of a sovereign God. Because random chance and time is what's determining everything that's happening in society. It gets worse. There is no original sin. If you believe in evolution, there is no original sin. And therefore, no guilt before God. If evolution is true then all human behavior is simply a response to natural selection. We're just trying to survive. It's actually a necessary... If, and there are people that believe in what they would call theistic evolution, that God is using evolution to, uh, to work out his will in humanity. But if God is allowing natural selection to determine his will, then we can have no guilt before him because survival of the species is what makes evolution work. And every self-centered action is then part of God's will because it promotes my survival. That makes sense? You follow me here? Yeah? Is this boring you? No? Okay. I, I, I get. This is so important because this this mindset, it seeps into our thinking. And it, it 
you know, a lot of people don't understand that if I'm accepting this, or if I am like, oh, it's not a big deal if people believe in evolution, I want you to realize that that undermines the entire Christian faith. You might as well just not believe. Just believe in evolution because that becomes your origin story. God is no longer the creator of your existence. Now, the reason I, I, I'm, I'm coming up to this point is because if Darwinism is true, evolution is true, there is no incarnation. We believe, so the doctrine of evolution is that Jesus is perfect God and perfect man. If evolution is true, there is no perfect man. We're still evolving. We're still getting better. Jesus isn't the perfect man. Give it another billion years and there'll be a better Jesus. There'll be someone better. And so even the idea of incarnation is the evolution is an anti-Christ ideology. Because the ultimate goal of evolution is what? Survival and reproduction. So the species can keep, can keep evolving. Right? And then redemption is found through the evolutionary process, not through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. The answer to our challenges in life would be what? Progress of the species, more complex, better species, right? If evolution is true, there is no biblical love. Because what did Jesus say was the greatest example of love? That is contrary to evolutionary theory. If everyone were to adopt sacrifice of self over self-preservation, evolution wouldn't work. So it's counter to biblical love. It's not just this idea that it's a scientific method. And, and even the idea of scientific method is an incomplete answer for the origin of life because the scientific method depends on natural observation. The scientific method can only give you a naturalistic uh, answer for a question that has a supernatural answer. So the scientific method cannot address the supernatural. It has to deny it, that there is something supernatural. It can't answer philosophical questions. It can't answer metaphysical questions. So the idea of taking evolution based on a scientific methodology as a, as a reasonable answer for the origin of life is flawed at its basic core. And ultimately, if evolution is true and there is no incarnation, then there is no purpose to life. There is no meaning because it all comes about through random chance and time. All right, my second big point is that Jesus is light. Jesus is light. The definition of light is that God, light equals in this book, Light equals God's absolute truth revealed. Light equals God's absolute truth revealed. Say God's absolute truth. All right. This is what it, it means when it says God, when John says God is light. That Jesus is true and he is the source of all truth. Now, what is the truth that Jesus reveals? What's the truth that Jesus reveals? First, that God is infinitely, perfectly righteous. We call it his, his glorious holiness. So here's the verse, right? John, 1 John 3, 16 through 18. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light. Say God's light. There is no darkness in him at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, but walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So here's that idea we were just talking about. Light equals God's absolute truth. God has 
an absolute truth because he is true. There's no falsehood in him. God has no hidden agenda. He has no mixed motives. Everything about God is absolutely true and absolutely right. Jesus reveals that to us. He's true and he's the source of all truth. He re- what does he reveal? Look at John chapter, well, all right, so that he's infinitely perfect and righteous. He reveals God, through his, his perfect, righteous life who God is. And look at what 1 John 4, uh, or John 1, 4 through 5 says. In him was life, talking about Jesus, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So the truth of who Jesus is has penetrated human history, and nothing can overcome that. Nothing can overwhelm that. Just like when you walk into a dark room and turn on the light, is there a struggle between light and dark? What happens? Darkness vanishes. Light always wins. And so this is the idea. Once Jesus appeared, every falsehood falls. His truth is what reigns. All right, John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Third point, Jesus is love. So what is, so we talked about light. What does light represent? God's absolute truth. Look at what 1 John 3, 16 through 18 says. By this, we know love. Because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay our lives down for the brothers. If anyone has this world's goods, sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed or truth. Moving on to chapter 4. Verses 7 through 12, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved, but that he first loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Say propitiation. I'll explain that in a second. It's a good, smart sounding word to make you sound really smart. You tell people, Jesus is our propitiation. Don't you know that? All right. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. All right, so Jesus' love, love equals God's ultimate goodness expressed. So light revealed what? God's absolute truth. Love reveals what? His ultimate goodness, God's ultimate goodness. And this is what Jesus shows us through his life. He reveals the ultimate truth about God, and he expresses the ultimate goodness of God. That's why everything Jesus does is an expression of the love of God. So he comes across a leper. What does he do? He heals them because that's an expression of God's ultimate goodness. He comes across a Samaritan outcast living a life of being a prejudicial life, being rejected by Jews. What does Jesus do? He gives her living water and welcomes her into the kingdom of God. He sees hungry people, he feeds them. He sees uh, distressed people, he comforts them. Everything Jesus does is an expression of God's ultimate goodness. God is good and the source of all goodness. Love is a necessary part of his nature. It's the way the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relate to each other. This is important. 
the way that the Father interacts with the Son, the way the Son interacts with the Father, the way the Holy Spirit interacts with the Father and Son is love. They express nothing but goodness to each other, right? Think about the infinite affection that they have, the perfect goodness that they express, the omnipotent kindness. You imagine if the if the heavenly father was like earthly fathers, what happens when an omnipotent God raises his voice or slams the door? You know, it's like end of the universe type stuff. God does everything out of love. He does everything out of love. It's the way he interacts within the Trinity. This is important because God was love before he chose to love us. Let that sink in for a second. God was love before he chose to love us. So God loves us not because of what we do. It's not in response to us. God loves us because of who he is in reality. It flows out of his nature, not ours. So God loves you because he is love love not because of anything you do so how many of you have ever felt like god couldn't possibly love me just me all right if you've had that thought realize that thought comes from a misunderstanding about who god is comes from a misunderstanding of who god is god loves you because he is love so turn the person next to you and say god loves you Right? Turn to somebody else. Look them right in the eye and say, God loves you. <laughs> Some of you aren't doing it, right? That You're not convinced that God loves the person next to you. Uh, say, God loves me. <laughs> See, you're a little more confident about that one. For <laughs> some reason, you're iffy about the person sitting next to you. God is drawing us into the loving fellowship he has with himself. This is the gospel. This is the good news. God isn't drawing you into just better relationships with each other. He's drawing you into relationship with himself. And what's his relationship with himself like? It's perfect. God wants to, God the Father wants to love you like he does his son. He wants to give you the same affection, the same appreciation, the same affirmation that he does his son. Fellowship is with God is what transforms you into a loving person. Now, I have a pet peeve um, that if you've known me for very long, you'll have heard me talk about this. Um, but I have a pet peeve. This, and it comes from this verse. 1 John 4, 8 says, If anyone, does not anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Here's my pet peeve. This idea that I have to love myself first in order to love other people. Anybody ever heard that? you got to love yourself first. This is the first and foremost thing you got to do. If you're going to be loving of other people, you've got to love yourself. This idea that we must love ourselves first in order to love others is completely unbiblical. 100%. There's not 1% of truth in the idea that I don't love you because I don't love myself. The Bible says I don't love you because I don't know God. That's the truth. If I knew God, his love would transform me into a loving person. Loving myself makes it less likely that I'll love you because I'm too busy with me. I've got no time for you. In fact, loving you requires sacrifice on my part, which isn't good for me. If I really loved myself, I wouldn't sacrifice for myself for you. Because to love means to express ultimate goodness. 
And if I need to love myself first, who is my first priority when it comes to goodness? Me. And if I'm the first priority of goodness in my life, self-sacrifice isn't in my best interest. I can't love you if I'm consumed with loving myself. It's God, his love in me. It's that supernatural, unlimited, sacrificial love flowing into my life by the power of God through his Holy Spirit that allows me to stop focusing on myself. And I, and I will say this, that their love gets distorted in human experience. And self-loathing is a distorted version of self-love because you are still the object of your attention. You are still the most important person. What's going to set you free is to embrace this incredible, unfathomable love of God that would wash over your whole life and experience his acceptance of you, his forgiveness of you, and would just completely free you up from self-focus. Now, I know that, that this is going to be potentially upsetting to some of you because you've bought into this idea of I've got to love myself, and it's been uh, in some ways helpful for you to get over pain and, and challenging issues in your life. And I'm not trying to diminish any of that. But what I'm saying is that it's not the ultimate solution and it's not biblical truth. It's a humanistic way of dealing with the issues and challenges that arise in life. It's not a biblical way to deal with it. And so even though it's hard and difficult, it doesn't, it's not what's really going to solve the problem. It's like if, you know, if I was a doctor and you had cancer and I were to give you, I don't know, codeine or Vicodin to, to help you with the pain, uh, is that wrong? No, but what is it not? It's not a cure. It's not a solution or something that will help you get through difficulty, but it won't heal those broken, wounded places in your life. All right, let me wrap this up. You guys okay? Okay. So that's how some looks are like, ah. Oh. All right. <laughs> All right. Here's some application. If since Jesus is light, what's the application for us? Step into the light and out of the darkness. Jesus is light. We need to step into that light. Here's what it looks like. First, be convicted of your sin. This is what stepping into the light looks like, right? If you're in the darkness, you're going to be comfortable with your sin. Once you step into the light, you are convicted. Because what do you see when they turn the light on? All right, that's why, you know, romantic rooms are usually dark, <laughs> right? It's, <laughs> it's easier to accept people in the dark, right? Confess your sin. This would be the second thing. Confess your sin. If you're going to step into the light, you've got to admit, I'm wrong. What I'm doing is wrong. What I'm doing doesn't glorify God. If I'm going to stay in the dark, then I keep my sin hidden. It's just between me and myself. Once I step into the light and confess, the Bible says that God will forgive me of all my sins. When I step into the light, I get forgiven. If I stay in the dark, I remain condemned. Not only do I get forgiven, I get cleansed of all my sin. Right? And I'm talking about 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God doesn't just forgive us. He washes it all away. When I step into the light, it's going to allow me to have fellowship with, G with God and others. If I remain in the darkness, 
I stay isolated and alone. This is something I want you to realize. If you have hidden sin in your life, it breaks relationships. You will not have close, intimate, trusting, vulnerable relationships with others because you're hiding sin. There is no way to have a good marriage and have hidden sin. There's no way to have a good relationship with your kids if they're hiding sin. And you'll feel it as a parent. You'll feel it. Your kids just pull away. They detach from you. There's a wall up, and you know there's hidden sin in your life. So if you're a parent and you feel that, don't ignore it. There's something up. Uh, Sin always isolates. It separates. It breaks relationships. And there's no way to be in the light uh, or no way to be in the dark and have loving, trusting relationships. All right. And then as a result, John says, we'll have fullness of joy. If you step into the light, the ultimate result is that you're going to end up with fullness of joy. If you stay in the dark, this is the deceptiveness of the devil, the deceptiveness of sin, to think that I would somehow have a better life as a result of staying in the dark, all I'm going to have is fullness of guilt. And it's going to weigh on me. David talked about it and he said, when I refused to confess my sins, my bones wasted away. Just that guilt eating you alive from the inside out. Second application for us is stay in the light. Once you step into the light, stay in the light. The hardest thing is coming into the light, right? Because you get exposed, right? It's like that dream of showing up at high school in your underwear, right? It's like, ah, I'm exposed. This is what confession feels like. It's hard. It's hard to step into the light. It's hard to admit I'm wrong. It's hard to say I failed. I'm I'm doing what's not glorifying to God. But it's what brings the healing process. It's what allows the light of Jesus into my life. It allows his love to cover a multitude of sins and restore fellowship in my life. And so once you get there, stay there. All right, this is what's going to cause you to stay in, a, in a, a loving relationship with God is relying on Jesus for a righteous lifestyle. I want you to realize that once you confess your sins and step into the light, what's gonna, what are you going to start seeing more of? More darkness in your own heart, more sin. So coming to the light doesn't mean you're perfect. What does it mean? You got more opportunity for confession. Right? But once, if I believe that God is light and I believe that he's love, there's no fear in coming to him. Because he's going to be faithful. He's not going to condemn me. He's going to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So keep coming to Jesus, confessing your sin. This is the key. And keep pressing into fellowship with God and other believers. This is why when people fall into sin, the first thing they stop doing is going to church. Because it's hard to be around other people who are plugged into Jesus when you're not. It becomes evident. So it's so important that you stay after, hang out. That's why we provide food, give you lunch, is so that you can have fellowship with other believers. That's why it's so important to get into a home gathering. Right? That's where you're going to have that fellowship. And then the last application is care enough to invite someone else into the light. Care enough to invite someone else into the light. Right? Express what you're experiencing. Are you experiencing forgiveness of sins? Are you experiencing cleansing of all your guilt and shame? Are you experiencing fellowship with God and other people? Are you experiencing the joy of the Lord in your life? Then invite someone else into it. This is what John starts his whole book with. The things we're experiencing, we want to declare to you so that you can come into that similar experience. And so we, we actually uh, put together these cards that we'll give you uh, after service. Uh, and there's five of them there. I want you to think of five people that you care enough to invite them to come hear about Jesus our, in our Christmas Eve services. We got two of them, one at our normal 10 a.m. service, and then we got a 5 p.m. service with the whole candlelight uh, 
uh, service. It'll be really cool, beautiful outside uh, if you haven't been a part of that. So I encourage you to, to do that. Um, invite other people into this experience uh, with Jesus. Amen? All right. Sorry it was so rough today. Um, but hopefully you gleaned something that you can take away and apply to your life. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, stand and we close in prayer. Uh, and we'll have some lunch, some time for fellowship afterwards. Well, Father, thank you for this amazing book, First uh, John. There's so much in there, God. Uh, so much more we could have covered and gone over, but we pray that uh, these truths would sink deep into our hearts that you are, Jesus, God in the flesh. That you have expressed the reality of the truth of God to us. You've demonstrated what a righteous life should look like. What it looks like to have fellowship with the Father. You've manifested the love of God to us. And I pray for everyone here that they would experience the reality of your love today. So, God, we, uh, we just thank you for Jesus, and we pray that our lives would be a declaration of his goodness to those around us. We trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you guys.